Okay, guys, let's start with prayer, and then we'll look at rebound and keep moving. Father, thank you once again for the opportunity to examine your word and to see the importance of uh, confession of sin. And uh, in fact, if, we've, if we have any sin, Lord, we know that we can confess them to you. And so we'll just pause for a moment of silence so that we can use First, first John 1 John 1.9 on our behalf. Thank you. Thank you, Father, for this opportunity to examine your word. We ask and pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. All right, let's turn to page 29. But let's just, uh, by way of review, because we're talking about David, look at page 28, just one page uh, to the left. Right there, the second paragraph on the top. If David had been in fellowship, remember this? If David had been in fellowship, we're talking about his sin uh, with Bathsheba. If David had been in fellowship when he saw this gorgeous woman, he may have resisted the temptation. You remember that? So it's very important. What is it that we are in need of in order for us to resist? Holy Spirit. Yeah, we need the Holy Spirit. We need to be in fellowship. We need that empowering uh, that comes from God the Holy Spirit. But if we are not in fellowship, if we're in sin, then we lose his influence. We lose, remember, walk by means of the Spirit, and you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. So if we're not in harmony with God the Holy Spirit, then we have no, we have no influence, we have no empowerment that comes from him. We don't lose the indwelling ministry of the Spirit, but we lose the filling ministry. It's the only command with reference to the Holy Spirit, be filled with the Spirit, right? Every other, everything else, as far as his ministry is concerned, is permanent. The only ministry uh, with regards to the Holy Spirit that's not permanent is the filling. So the author says, if he had been in fellowship, then he, uh, when he saw the woman, the gorgeous woman, he may have resisted the temptation. And I had pointed out last week that I like the fact that he said he may have. And it uh, doesn't guarantee that you won't sin, doesn't guarantee that you will not give in to temptation. But you have a greater chance of being able to resist. And I think that's important. After all, he had three wives and at least ten concubines. And so seeing such a breathtaking woman was not an unusual event in his life. So women were not a problem for, for David. <clears throat> and then in the middle, being tempted in your area of weakness when you are in fellowship is one thing. But being tempted in your area of weakness when you are out of fellowship may be something else entirely. You see the difference? He's saying if you're being tempted in your area of weakness when you're in fellowship, that's one thing. Okay, we all get tempted, right? Um, but being tempted in your area of weakness when you're out of fellowship may be something else entirely. And that's what the author is trying to stress, is that we're all going to be tempted. We have areas of weakness, but it's better to tackle or... or uh, deal with the temptation with harmony while you're in harmony with God rather than out of fellowship Because when you're out of fellowship, you have no power of your own uh, So you have no power of God from originating from God So there's a high probability that you'll slip just like David Look at the bottom of 28 at the bottom of 28 a believer out of fellowship is capable of committing sin as despicable as an unbeliever. So unbelievers don't commit worse sins. We could commit the exact same sins as an unbeliever. We just create it, we're just more creative in hiding it, right? So um, I think he hit the, the bullseye here. Any believer in Christ is capable of committing sins just as bad as an unbeliever. Top of 29. Right there in the middle, all sin removes a believer from fellowship with God and may initiate a disastrous series of sins. So this compounding of sins is preceded with broken fellowship. And so if, you have, if your fellowship or your harmony with God is broken, 
then don't be surprised if it leads to sin, which leads to more sin and more sin and more sin. I mean, this is what we're seeing with the light in the life of David. So it may initiate a disastrous series of sins. David was about to initiate a series of sins that would impact his entire kingdom. So this is where we left off. Look at 2 Samuel 11, right there on the top there. Um, David sent to Joab saying, send me Uriah the Hittite. So Joab sent Uriah to David. When Uriah came to him, David asked concerning the welfare of Joab and the people and the state of the war. Before we proceed, help me someone summarize what happened last week. What happened with David? You guys remember? What actually happened? He, he got Bathsheba pregnant knowing that she has a husband. Okay, so... David got Bathsheba pregnant. Okay, very good. How did it start? He was bored. He was bored. And so during his boredom, what did he do? He fell out of fellowship. Okay, he, he got out of fellowship. But what was he doing? He was on the top somewhere? On the roof. On the roof. And what was he doing? The gar Checking out his garden. Okay, bearing fruit there. And then all of a sudden, wow, what is that? Right? So, then he sends his servants to find out who this woman was. And then, of course, he lays with her and she is pregnant. So, look at what I want you... The reason why I'm saying this is because we don't want to miss the, the series of sins. Yeah. Okay? Because... If we just jump in in 2 Samuel 11 without considering how it started, then we're going to miss something. It started, the moment, he, the moment he broke fellowship with God, and how did he break fellowship with God? Disobedience. Disobedience how? Because he's supposed to be with the army. That's right. Yeah. He shunned his responsibility, Right. So he shuns his responsibility. He's hanging out at home. Being lazy. Being lazy. So that started it all. So we have to look at the pattern here. So he shuns his responsibility. He should have been out there with the men leading the pack. But he doesn't. And so because of that, he falls into sin. He's out, of, he's out of fellowship with God. He falls into sin. He gives into sin. He gets her pregnant. And now look what he does here. Now, 2 Samuel 11, 6-7. Then David sent to Joab. You remember who Joab was? He's his army commander. Yeah. Chief of, chief of staff, right? His nephew. Yeah. Nephew. Chief of Staff, send me Uriah the Hittite. Joab went to Uriah to David. Uh, so Joab sent Uriah to David. When Uriah came to him, David asked concerning the welfare of Joab and the people and the state of the war. Notice what the author says. When he questioned Uriah, David feigned concern for the battlefield situation. Pretended like he was really interested, right? David was not at all interested in the siege of Rabbah. Instead, he schemed to conceal his seduction of Bathsheba. So he's, he's working on a plan. He's trying to cover sin, right? So David concocted a clever ploy to lure Uriah home to be with his wife because he hoped to escape blame for her pregnancy. David's appearance of virtue when he inquired about the army was nothing more than hypocrisy and subterfuge. It's all just, it's fake. He's not really interested. 
Hypocrisy is a common characteristic of what? So when we're in carnality, when we're in sin, we're already, it, it, as we're going around uh, representing him, we're already hypoc we're being hypocrites in a very real sense, right? We're saying one thing, but our actions are not reflecting who we are representing. Now, that doesn't mean you're not saved. It just means that, you know, that's kind of the definition of hypocrisy. You're being someone you're not supposed to be. You're representing someone and you're really not. Hypocrisy is a common characteristic of carnality. A believer out of fellowship often attempts to conceal or deny his sin. Isn't that true? It wasn't me. In fact, what, what happened in the Garden of Eden? Were they trying to conceal it? And who was to blame, ultimately, according to all three? God. Yeah. Yeah, but ultimately, it was God's fault. When you, when you follow, you know, he, it was him, it was the serpent. God made all of them. So basically, they were saying, well, you know, it's your fault. The woman you gave me. So are you saying it's me? It's my fault? The serpent that you made. Are you saying it's my fault? Same thing. It's, uh, it, we attempt, the believer out of fellowship attempts to conceal or deny sin. With each progressive sin, David was transformed from a spiritual giant into a carnal hypocrite. He was a giant before. He's not doing too good at this point. Look at what it says in 11.8 of 2 Samuel. Then David said to Uriah, Go down to your house, wash your feet. And Uriah went out of the king's house, and a present from the king was sent out after him. Wash your feet is a Hebrew idiom for enter the house. In the time of David, the streets of Jerusalem were so dusty that every household had a foot bath at the door. And before entering his house, a man would remove his sandals and wash his feet. When a guest knocked on the door, instead of saying, come in, the response was, wash your feet. That's in the ancient world. Notice 2 Samuel 11, 9. But Uriah slept at the door of the king's house with all the servants of his lord and did not go down to his house. What can you say about Uriah? Good man? Yeah. Bad man? He's not obeying. Good man. Why would he be good? He's honorable. Honorable. He's disobeying David, but he's being honorable. How is he being honorable? I mean, is it dishonorable to go to your house? Um, he feels guilty uh, enjoying his wife while his fellow servicemen are poor. There you go. So they're all out there. And so instead of going home relaxing and being with his wife and, you know, turning on the TV and checking Facebook, he's there with the men. He's there in the barracks. He's there uh, away from his wife so that uh, he would not enjoy the pleasures that could have been his because he was an honorable man. All right? Look at what it says on page 30. Uriah failed to comply with David's wishes. Remember, David had a plan, right? He concocted a plan. Uriah failed to comply with David's wishes, frustrating his plan. Whose plan? David's plan. So this guy was being honorable, and David's not getting his way. So 
we're going to see what he's going to do after that. He's, he's trying to get him to cover up his sin. He's trying to get Uriah to cover up David's sin. So that didn't work, so he has to come up with another plan. Instead, he slept at the door of the king's house. The door of the king's house refers not to David's palace, but to the guard house near the king's gate. Not even the, the, the king's uh, door. It's not even in the front of his house. Located there was, were special barracks to billet the royal guards. Rather than going home to spend the night with his wife, Uriah moved into the barracks of the guardhouse with the palace guard. So he hung out over there. He didn't even go home. Uriah was a responsible soldier who would not enjoy the pleasures of home while the army was in the field. Now what do you think Uriah was thinking. For in order for him to sleep here with the guard. What well, what do you think he was thinking in his mind? I think he was back at the front. Okay, he was still at war. Yeah. He was concerned about his men, he was concerned about what was going on. So he probably you know, we're we're adding, we don't know what the text would say, but as human beings, as men, um, if we forego going home, then what would we be thinking? He doesn't care for his duty. He doesn't care for which one? For his job. Okay. So, okay, so you've got all these possibilities. He was thinking, his mind was still there with the men. He did not have uh, the desire to loosen up or relax. This is not a time to relax. I was asked to come home and this is not to just take advantage of the time and to relax. I can't. I've got men out there who are fighting. How can I relax when they're counting on me to be by their side? Right? That's, a, that's an honorable person. That's a good man. And that's the reason why he was in charge. Even in, in situations like this where he was given permission to go home, he wouldn't. It speaks of his character and the integrity of this man. Notice what it says in 10 through 11. Now when they told David, saying, Uriah did not go down to his house, David said to Uriah, Have you not come from a journey? Aren't you tired? Don't you need to rest? Don't you want to check up on your family? Don't you want to check up on your wife? Why did you not go down to your house? And Uriah said to David, The ark in Israel and Judah are staying in temporary shelters. And my lord Joab and the servants of my lord are camping in the open field. In other words, all the people are out there in place doing what they're supposed to do. Shall I then go to my house to eat, to drink, and what's he say next? To lie with my wife? By your life, listen to this, by your life and the life of your soul, I will not do this thing. I can't. Everyone is out there ready for battle, in the midst of a battle. I can't enjoy myself here. I've never done that before. Notice what he says next. The author says in the middle, David must have winched as he heard this reply. 
All his life, David had displayed a tremendous sense of responsibility. So Uriah's loyalty and concern for his troops should have awakened David's conscience. Wait a minute, that's supposed to be something I would say and I would do. Now it's coming from Uriah? Imagine if you were David and you knew what you know what you know now and your ploy or your plan was to get him to lay with his wife. I wonder what you'd be thinking. I wonder what I would be thinking. It's not working. I mean, he's in deep right now, right? So imagine, let's just, we're going to be creative now. So it doesn't work. What other options could he have taken? Aside from, uh, we'll see later on. What are some options? What are some other options he could have done? What do you think? Instead of telling him to go send him out in the front line so that he would die, let's be, if we had our way, what other options are there? Is there other, another option to, instead of sending him out in, front, in the front lines? What do you think? I mean, it's hard now. It's very tense, right? The sin is great. For example, could he have said, look, we need to talk. Um, while you were gone, something happened between me and your wife. Could he have said that? Did he say that? No. Huh? He's very loyal friend. Yeah. Yeah, that. that's right. It's hard. It is hard. And that's probably why he didn't. What other options are there? Is there another option? There isn't much, right? Maybe if we really think hard, maybe. Um, but... Uh, can't go too far now, right? It's already, it's already done. Look at what he says next. While the entire general staff was enduring hardship, hardships in the field, David was enjoying the pleasures in the palace. If David had been in fellowship he and Uriah would have left for Rabbah at once. But what did he do? David made another attempt to entice Uriah home. He could have done the right thing. He could have left and went to battle. But he didn't. What did he do? Came up with another plan. Look at what he said. Well, look at what it says in 2 Samuel 11. David said to Uriah, Stay here today also. Oh, that's another day off, huh? Is this would pay? Is this pay? Would pay? Stay here today also, and tomorrow I will let you go. So Uriah remained in Jerusalem that day and the next. Now David called him, and he ate and drank before him. And he made him what? Okay, so why would he get him drunk? So he would relax his inhibitions. Okay, he would relax his inhibitions. He would more, be more susceptible to probably being with his wife, possibly. Um, it might be worth noting that since it's originating from the scripture, we need to be careful with alcohol. Especially if we have uh, kids, you know, sons and daughters. Because apparently what the scripture is implying is that if the person is drunk, they're more inclined to do what is probably not the best thing to do. 
You guys get that? I, I, I kind of see that there, right? So he's trying to get his, he's trying to get Uriah to do something that he normally wouldn't do because he passed with flying colors. He is a commendable man. He's a man of character and integrity. So now maybe if I give him a little alcohol, maybe he'll, he'll give in a little bit. David called him and he ate and drank before him and he made him drunk. And in the evening he went out to lie on his bed with his Lord's servants. But he did not go down to his house. So notice what it says on the bottom. David made Uriah drunk. David hopes that once Uriah's inhibitions break down, he will go to his wife's bed. David exhibited all the manipulative skills characteristic of the carnal hypocrite. What was he doing? What was David doing? Hmm? He's trying to cover his base. He's trying to cover it, right? And so what is he doing to Uriah? Manipulate him so he can go home. Okay. So he goes home. He goes back. He stays an extra. He stays back additional time, right? And then he gets him what? Drunk. Still nothing. You think he stops here? You think he, the sin stops here? Of course not. We know that. David exhibited all the manipul manipulative skills characteristic of the carnal hypocrite. Frantic to escape the consequences of his own bad decisions. David's cruel cunning reached a new low. Some of the most conniving people are believers out of fellowship. You guys agree with that? Sometimes the worst people to deal with are Christians, especially if they're out of fellowship. Did his manipulation succeed under David's insistence? Uriah did get drunk. But in spite of the temptation, Uriah maintained his military standards of integrity. What are you guys seeing here? Help me out. I'm here for the first time. I'm not getting it. So I don't get it. What are you guys studying? What's going on here? So a man sees a woman. So what? Every guy looks at a woman, right? So help me out. What, I'm here. I'm new to this class. What's going on? I don't, I don't see the problem. I mean, who hasn't been tempted? What's, what, what am I supposed to learn from this? I'm, I'm new at this Bible stuff. What do you want me to walk away with? They disobedience when all the, all the, the sin that he made he, he started getting excuses and prepare the way to, to confuse his uh, military assistant. Okay, good. And then everything that he asked him to do, he refused because he was a man of integrity. Okay. He cared about his army. Okay. He's, he know the difference to be in his, his White House on the army. Mm -hmm. So as a soldier, he preferred to be around his people. Okay, very good. So, am I supposed to be like Uriah? Mm -hmm. Sure, you should. If you were a soldier, you should. Okay, good. What else am I supposed to get from this? Very good. Good observation. So there's uh, key players, David, Bathsheba, Uriah. 
So I'm supposed to be like Uriah, not like David. Or what? Or does someone else have a different take? Am I supposed to be like Uriah or David? He's supposed to be like Uriah, but David, he fall in temptation. Mm -hmm. So okay. like anybody else can fall in temptation. Okay, so good fall into temptation, that's true. But he did not have a strong responsibility to tell the truth mm -hmm. to this guy. So he looked for ways to, to manipulate him. So uh, David looked for ways to manipulate him. Okay. What else? Very good. Quite a few there. None of the tricks worked. Ah, oh, none of the tricks worked. Okay, none of the tricks worked. Very interesting, very observant. So, what happened, what I'm seeing, if you're right, if this trick doesn't work, I have to come up with another trick. If that trick doesn't work, I have to come up with another one, another one, another one. Until what? Until something works. Until something works. And when it works, that what does that mean, something works? Works, what do you mean? Like what? Keeps him from being found out. Ah, keeps him from being found out. Okay. So David was coming up with the tricks. It wasn't working. He, he gave several. It didn't work. What else? What else do you guys see? Let's see. The, if he wasn't going to confess his degree of, I want to call it, um, I can't think of the word, his, he was getting frustrated and he would go to a higher level of, of, I mean, at first he wanted Uriah to go home to be with his wife because who wouldn't want to be with your wife? And then, he wouldn't do that, so then he wanted, he wanted to get him drunk, he got him drunk. So the next step was, it, it's the sin is just multiplying and it's becoming greater. Okay, good. It's, 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 yeah, I, I would agree, it's getting greater. So because he won't confess, it yeah. compounds. It's compounding, right. So I instead of dealing with it, he's trying to sweep it under the the rug. And the way he's doing it is coming up with these manipulative tricks. Because he's trying to, he wants, what, what was the word you said? It, he wants to deal with it, he wants to, to fix it, solve it, right? He wants to be in the clear. He doesn't want to be found. He doesn't want to be found guilty of the, of the sin. What else? Very good. So we talked a little about um, David. Talked a little about a little about Uriah. I have a question. I don't know if this is getting off topic, but mm -hmm. um, David is his highest in command, right? Right. right. I mean, could David theoretically have said, "I order you to go into your life"? In other words. Would the riot be violating a direct order? Um, I don't know if there is any military command okay. like that. Yeah, okay. I, I <laughs> mean, I can't so really, like yeah, I, I don't, I mean, I think he could have made it happen if that were true. Okay. He could have insisted. Um, but they lost his authority when he talked to him. He talked like a friend. Mm -hmm. No, not, not as a kid. Okay, so he, he talked to him not, like... He, he was no kid anymore. So he talked to him like a, a, friend. a friend. Okay, how did you get that? Very observant, very good. Because, because the way that he talked to him, go, let's go eat. Ah. Let's go drink. Let's okay. Go home, take it easy, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. So he was talking like, not like a kid. Yeah. Because he has no more uh, uh, authority as a king. Yeah. His, his conscience was not right. Mm -hmm. So he tried to use 
kindness and love mm -hmm. with his friends. Mm -hmm. So it so, so. never happen if he was a, not commit that kind of sin. So what you're saying is because the big picture is he's trying to hide his sin, even his authority was removed because of the fact that he's trying to deal with the sin. Uh, he loses some of that because now he's talking to him more like a friend. Okay. Interesting. In the same book, I just looked it up, chapter 23, where mm. he mentions the uh, heroes of David, his, mm. his friends who were warriors, the Uriah is mentioned in there too. Yeah, as a, as a hero. Yeah. Yeah. So he's uh, one of his warrior friends. So one of his warrior friends, he's a hero, uh, he's got good leadership, what's he going to do to him? He's going to have him killed. So this man is not just someone who is one of the men who signed up to be a part of the military. This is someone here who has good relations, relationship with, with uh, David. I want you to see the, how sin can cloud and distort things. And make things worse. Um, don't you really ask me to David even before he became king, right? Mm-hmm. So Been many years, actually. So you, you've got years of friendship, years of at least military dealings together, where in one chapter he's a, considered a hero, a warrior, a friend, um, we sometimes wonder, will a Christian do that to, or a believer do that to their friend? Well, we, we certainly can see it here. But even if we back up a little bit, we know that even brothers will. Remember Cain and Abel? So when you're trying to deal with sin... You gotta get you gotta get that under control. And when I say get it under control, I'm not saying will it. You need you need God's assistance. Because we're seeing that it's 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 getting worse. It's compounding, like Mark said. Right? Any anything else? What about the woman? Did she do anything wrong? I think she did. Yeah, she's an accomplice. She's an accomplice, okay. And you think she did something wrong? What, because what? She, she did not, she, she, she should hide while well, well, beating herself. Okay. Why did she display herself so that there's other people can see? Well, we have to remember that I think the woman, Bathsheba, was, uh, that was just normal routine for her, you know, um, bathing. And uh, the, the rooftop was high enough to where he can actually see down and see her. So I... There's nothing in the text that says that she was purposely tempting him. We, d we don't know that for sure. Um, but we know that uh, she went to see him when David said, call her, I want to know who she is, right? You think she could have responded? She could have said, no, uh, I don't care who he is. Um, I'm staying here. Could she have said that? Yeah, probably not going to be easy without getting in trouble. And probably she had no idea what he was up to anyways. You know, she's got, he's married, three wives, ten concubines, so she's probably not even thinking because Uriah, they probably sat together multiple times uh, with the husband since they were friends, right? Talking about war stories or something. Yeah, they're neighbors. So, but the thing is, is that he saw. Now, if that were us today, if we were in that kind of situation, what would we have done or what should we do? 
So here we are, we're on our rooftop, and we look down and we see someone bathing. What would be the thing to do? Well, the real let, let's let's uh, pretend like it's happening right now. So we're sitting here, uh, and then all of a sudden we look and we say, "Oh wow, she's naked." What do we do? Hmm? Walk away. Yeah. No need to confess. No need to confess if we haven't committed any sin yet, right? So we need to flee, flee all youthful lusts, right? The problem was, for David, was he sat there and he didn't flee. He just kept looking and looking and looking and he said, tell her to come to me. Right? So there's these things that we can observe. David, instead of fleeing, he stood there and he was watching. And isn't that the problem with sin today? If we, you know, if we focus on the sin, eventually we're going to carry it out. You know, temptation is not a sin. Sin is a sin. Temptation is the precursor to sin. But if we don't give in to temptation, then there's no sin. The proof of this is Jesus Christ himself in Matthew 4. Was he not tempted by the adversary himself? But he didn't give in to sin. How did he counter sin? With the word. Every time Satan tempted him, with something, you know, you must be hungry. You've, you've, been, you've been without food for 40 days and 40 nights. I, I can hear your stomach from here. I'm sure it would, wouldn't be a problem if you turned those stones to bread. And Jesus said, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. So you'll notice that he gets tempted several times and Jesus deals with it several times with the Word of God. That's how you resist the devil. <clears throat> By the way, that's, that's really how you resist the devil. You know, some people have this notion that when we resist the devil, we're, we're commanding him to leave. I command you to leave in the name of Jesus. But the real way to uh, resist the devil <laughs> is through the Scripture. I mean, Jesus resisted the devil, and that's through the application of his word. That's the way resisting looks like, biblically speaking. So notice, top of 31, David's cruel cunning reached a new low. Some of the most conniving people are believers out of fellowship. Did his manipulation work? No. Under David's insistence, Uriah did get drunk, but in spite of the temptation, Uriah maintained his military standards of integrity. Look at 11.14, 2 Samuel. Now it came about in the morning that David wrote a letter to Joab and sent it by the hand of Uriah. Notice, David was desperate. The only solution to his dilemma seemed to be the death of Uriah. He can't seem to deal with this, so the only thing he could do is, you know what, maybe, you know what, if he's dead, then he won't, I, won't have to, I won't have to explain what happened. That's what I'll do. So, to accomplish his wicked deed, David wrote a letter to Joab. Not only would David be guilty of murder, but he would make Joab an accessory. David knew an officer of Uriah's integrity would never examine a letter he carried. That says a lot about him, right? It's amazing because everything he's doing, he's doing to a guy who had all of the strengths that David had. That's right. So he's like really, not only is he sinning, but he's violating an I mean, even deeper level. At a deeper level, because he should have been doing exactly what Uriah was doing. Even saying here that he knew Uriah would never examine the letter. That's right. He knew what a, yeah. What a man of integrity he was. That's, that's such a mouthful. Here, send this to Joab. He could have easily opened it and checked it out and said, "Hey, what's in here?" People do that today. I mean, it would have been 
easier for him to send somebody else. That's right. Of less integrity. That's right. That's right. But he didn't because he knew he knew who he was dealing with. But that's really a reflection that should have been a reflection, and it was to a certain extent how David was, and eventually bounced back up, right? But notice what the author says here. To accomplish this, his wicked deed, David wrote a letter to Joab. Not only would David be guilty of murder, but he would make Joab an accessory. So there's a double sin here, right? Double sin. Joab is also going to be involved. David knew an officer of Uriah's integrity would never examine a letter he carried. Notice what it says in 1115. He had written in the letter saying, Place Uriah in the front line of the fiercest battle. Some tra one translation says the hottest. You know what that means? There's a lot of firing going on. Right in the front lines where chances of surviving slim, extremely remote. And it gets worse. He tells them what? We, see, we know that he tells, um, make sure you pull the men back so that he's going to be by himself. Notice, place Uriah in the front line of the fiercest battle and withdraw from him so that he may be struck down and what? Nice. So this is premeditated. This is planned. What's the plan? What's the plan to solve his sin issue? To kill Uriah. Yeah. If he kills Uriah, how is that going to fix it? How does it fix it? Okay, I get, I get rid of them. Does it fix it? No. But it helps in, in, in what way? Doesn't that... Hmm? He was so blind, I was thinking, if I kill Raya, everything go away. Yeah. But that's not the case. No, it's not the case. Who knows? God knows, right? Ultimately. Yeah. When Uriah wouldn't have slept with Bathsheba, so Uriah would be, if he was gone, then there would be no evidence that, that someone slept with him. Because if David's gone, if, if uh, Uriah's gone, then it could be anybody now. Right? right? He could just say, uh, are you talking about? Uh, of course, Bathsheba will probably say something. But with his power and authority, he could have probably just said, hey, you need to make sure this doesn't go to anyone. But if he's out of the picture, now he doesn't have to answer to Uriah. He doesn't have to fess up and say, it was me. That's his way. Of, this is a, a believer's way Who's in, a believer who's in carnality, this is the way that David resolved his problem or solved his problem, at least in his mind at the moment. He thought it would be better to, to sweep it under the carpet. Notice what it says next. So, not only would David be guilty of murder, but he would make Joab an accessory. Place Uriah in the front line of the fiercest battle, withdraw from him, so that he may be struck down and die. Joab understood the wishes of his commander-in-chief. The order was clear. Advance on Rabbah with Uriah leading, then retreat, leaving Uriah isolated and unprotected from the enemy. That's pretty sad. That's like a traitor, right? You go there, you have your guns, you have your weapons, you have your men with you. All of a sudden you're shooting, you're shooting, you're shooting, you're shooting, and you're like, where are you guys going? Pulls back and you're by yourself, unprotected. That's unheard of in the military. You don't leave your, your men. You, you either... You fight together or you die together for your country. 
unheard of. But who, by the way, who, who, who made this happen? Who's, who, who made the order? Dave. So Joab couldn't, he was not in a position to, to disobey. He understood, Joab understood the wishes of his commander-in-chief. The order was clear. Advance on Rabbah with Uriah leading, then retreat, leaving Uriah isolated and unprotected from the enemy. Notice what it says in 16 to 17. So it was as Joab kept watch on the city that he put Uriah at the place where he knew there were valiant men, strong men, aggressive men. And the men of the city went out and fought against Joab. And some of the people among David's serpent, uh, servants fell. And Uriah the Hittite, what? Also died. Hmm, interesting. Uriah's unit sorted just below the city walls. How tragic that such a valiant soldier was sacrificed for David's lust. One person's sin cost another man's life. Mark, you were in the military, right? Let's just say you, you were in combat, you were in war. <laughs> yeah, but let's just say. What would happen if you left one man behind? Like if you just, hey, this is too much, and you pulled out. What, do you, what would they say to you guys when you got back? Would be the ultimate, the ultimate betrayal. Yeah. You left your... That's right. How could you, how dare you, right? It's family. You're like family there. You know, you may, you may disagree, you may argue, you may not like each other, but when war is on, all of a sudden you're unified. And you go out there, you cover each other's back. You don't abandon anybody. And to think this was the order. He was directly ordered. Joab was ordered to pull back so that I won't have to deal with this guy anymore. Notice, Joab sent and reported to David all the events of the war. And he charged the messenger saying, when you have finished telling all the events of the war to the king, and if it happens that the king's wrath rises, and he says to you, why did you go so near to the city to fight? Did you not know that they would shoot from the wall? Who struck down Abimelech, the son of Jerusalem? Did not a woman throw an upper millstone on him from the wall? So that he died at Thebes? Why did you go so near the wall? Then you shall say, your servant Uriah the Hittite is dead also. What is he saying there? What's he telling the messenger to say? If the king's getting upset, this is how you deal with it. There's a loss, but let him know Uriah is dead. Remind him. 
Isn't that what he says here? Why would Joab expect David to become angry? Top of 32. Because Joab made a tactical blunder which cost the lives of several men. So who died for the sin of David? So it's not just Uriah. This was a tactical, the author calls it a tactical blunder. It cost him several other men aside from Uriah. He was trying to follow the direct orders from David, but they also had to, there were several men who had to also pay with their life. Yeah, he is. And how does he cover his butt? How does he cover his butt? You're right. How does he cover his butt, though? Yeah. What? Several men died? Don't you know that if you go next to the wall, that they're going to shoot from the top? Yeah, but Uriah's dead. Oh, okay. That's cool, then. Sorry. I get it. As long as he's dead, we're good. So it's not just Uriah. Because now Joab made a tactical error. Because now it cost him several men aside from Uriah. So Joab couldn't have done differently. Not really. Not really. You can't, I mean, could you in the military dis disobey the one in charge? You probably can, but you're going to be in trouble. But the thing is, is that he didn't. Joab didn't. It would have been, there would have been severe consequences, I'm sure. Right? So what we're seeing now is, okay, let's, let's start back. Okay, there's the woman. He lusted. What happened next? Let's, let's make sure we're following this. She got pregnant. Huh? She got pregnant. She got pregnant. Okay, what happened next? He's trying, to cover up. trying to cover up. Good. So how did he try to cover up? What was the first plan? Send him, send him back home so he could be with his wife. And hopefully, you know, they'll have uh, intimacy and then, hey, I'm covered. It didn't work. What did he do next? He got him drunk. Got him drunk? You know what? Uh, stay another day. You are worthy of an additional day off. And uh, let's talk. Let's eat. Uh, have you tried this before? This is good drink. He got drunk. And what did Uriah do? He got drunk, but did he go home? No. He still didn't go home. Uriah is doing good. This is a man of integrity. This is a man of principle and purpose. He put his men first. He put his men first. How do we know he put his men first? Because of his position, as far as what he did. He could have been home, he could have been relaxing, but he didn't relax. He can't relax. He's got men out there. It's a lot at stake. It's probably surprised why he's being real nice to him, I would think. You stay home another, stay back one more day. By the way, here's a, here's a good drink. What happened after that? That didn't work. Another, another person involved. Okay, another person involved. And who was the person that was involved? Okay. So... As Mark was asking earlier, could he have disobeyed? Imagine you're being forced against your will, probably, uh, because it might have cost him his career. But he followed orders. So when he followed orders, he was co in compliance with David. And what was the cost? Ryan, 
So think about this. We're, when we're covering up sin, someone could be paying for this other than self. And by the way, did, did uh, Bathsheba pay for it too? So she lost her husband. She's pregnant. I wonder what she was thinking at the moment, knowing that it's not Uriah's child. And this was done behind his back. So Uriah is dead. Several men are dead. Joab was involved. I wonder what he was thinking. It doesn't really say much here. But there were consequences to one man's sin. And several people have paid for it so far, including the wife. Notice what it says next. He left a unit exposed. Why would Joab expect David to become angry? Because Joab made a tactical blunder which cost the lives of several men. He left a unit exposed and unprotected so its commander would be killed. When David heard this report, he would probably become furious with Joab for committing such a deadly error. So Joab said, if David becomes angry, just say to him, Uriah the Hittite is dead also. Joab was protecting himself by reminding David of his previous order. You're the one who wanted him dead, remember? Well, he's dead. Notice 20 to, 22 to 24, 2 Samuel 11. So the messenger departed and came and reported to David all that Joab, Joab had sent him to tell. And the messenger said to David, the men prevailed against us and came out against us in the field. But we pressed them as far as the entrance of the what? The of the gate. That's where the problem was. Because now there's additional support on their side. Moreover, the archers shot at your servants from the wall. So some of the king's servants Servants are dead, and your servant Uriah the Hittite is also dead. So David played the hypocrite. Listen to this. Then David said to the messenger, Thus you'll, you shall say to Joab, Do not let this thing displease you. Don't let it bother you. For the sword devours one as well as another. Make your battle against a city stronger and overthrow it, and so encourage him. What is he saying here? Let me, let me uh, read it from a slightly different translation. Well, let me, uh, the messenger went to Jerusalem and gave a complete report to David. The enemy came out against us in the open fields, he said, as we chased them back to the city gate. The archers on the wall shot arrows at us. Some of the king's men were killed, including Uriah the Hittite. Well, tell Joab not to be discouraged, David said, the sword devours this one today and that one tomorrow. Fight harder next time and conquer the city. What do you think, Mark? It's called minimization. Minimization. <laughs> <laughs> Minimizing the, the atrocity. By it's okay. It happens. Fight harder next time. Right. As long as... We always lose somebody. Ah... <laughs> uh, 
And uh, the author says, David playing the hypocrite. So, uh, uh, it's a hypocrite, all right. Notice, David's encouragement of Joab was sheer pretense. Joab lost the battle because he obeyed David's orders to have Uriah killed. David never before had treated the loss of his men so, what's the word there? Casually. This was not his normal practice. No great captain of history would be so philosophical in defeat as to say the sword devours one as well as another. Uh, 11.26 So when the wife of Uriah heard that Uriah her husband was dead, she mourned for her husband. Somehow the Holy Spirit in his wisdom, wanted us to see this. He wanted us to see that it so impacted her that the word mourn is used here so that it would be crystal clear that the loss of her husband brought about mourning on this woman. There is a deep sense of love for her husband and unfortunately, one man tried to deal with the sin in a way that's not pleasing before God. And it cost her, her husband, Uriah, um, several men, and even Joab for doing something that he was not accustomed to doing. Yeah, I'm curious what he was thinking as well. That's why I was wondering, uh, I mean, I know we can't really deviate far from the text, but sometimes just with our creativity, sometimes it's interesting to think about what he or anybody was thinking in the scripture during the time of something like this. So if we were going to take our best guess, and, we're, and we're, we're not holding each other here. Uh, we're not saying that this is gospel truth. But if we were to guess what Joab must have been going through when given the orders to pull back so that Uriah would be killed. What do you think he was thinking? We know what the text says. But if we were going to take our best guess, what do you think Joab was thinking? Is there anything there, here that would indicate one way or the other how he was thinking? It was not much, right? But what do you think he was thinking? What do you think, Mick? If Joab was to talk to you, if he comes in and sits down here and it's just the two of you and you ask him what was going on during this time, what do you think he would say? Well, in the first place, Joab knows that Uriah is, is a real friend and a real soldier to David. So, mm -hmm. is Joab probably thinking that David's doing a bad thing? That's probably... Okay, so... In his mind, he was thinking something's going on already. Okay, but how, I mean, imagine you in charge of setting it up like this so that Uriah would be killed. It's really hard. And you want your own soldier to be killed by an enemy? It's, maybe in your eyes, minds, it's not easy. Yeah. But yeah. Hmm. Mark? I see two characters. Oh. Okay. The way I see it is um Joab. He took the opportunity. Maybe I think, hey, this is my opportunity to be the the leader. Hmm. Just taking map, you know. Okay. Look at look at um 
Uriah. Mm -hmm. He wanted to send home, but he wanted to be with his men. So the character of that one is like, hey, no, no one is left behind. Yeah. But for Joab, he's like, I know what's going on, but I'm going to do it anyway. Yeah. Hmm. So it's, it just. Yeah. Okay, it's interesting. Yeah. So you, you, the, the mindset of Joab is uh, more to his advantage? Hmm, okay. Any, any thoughts, Samuel? If you had to guess? What would Joab say, you think? Just being a little creative tonight. I think he would... Uh, I guess that's what you're saying, that, that he would think, well, I can blackmail him later on. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay, so he can blackmail David. Maybe, you know what, I need a promotion. Um, can you help me out? Because he didn't question. Hmm? He didn't question. No, he didn't. That's right. He didn't question, and he knew what the, as the author pointed out, the, the order was clear. And so, what does that say about Joab? Because who's the one turning their backs on their people? So you've got David and Joab now. See? See, the way I see it too, the order was for him to go in front and everybody else to Pull back, yeah. But then at the end, several men died. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's a tough one. What do you think, Mark? No, I, I agree with everything. I, I think you know. Obviously, at the end, Joab's only interested in one thing. He wants to let David know that he got it done. What he wanted. To, so huh. he was worried about his own skin. Yeah, yeah. You know, that was ultimate. But I'm, I mean, I, you would think that maybe Joab was a man of character. He would be right. We were very conflicted. You know his thoughts would be like, what am I doing? Mm -hmm. I don't know if he wrestled with that or... It doesn't say, and you know, it's, we're just being creative tonight. Mm -hmm. We can't prove, we're not proving anything, we're just guessing, mm -hmm. uh, being creative. But um, sometimes that helps us see the gravity of the sin itself. It reminded me too of like, sort of like going back to what you were talking about in the garden. You know? mm -hmm. It's like everybody was protecting themselves, you know. Yeah. The woman yeah. was protecting herself and yeah. the man, Adam was protecting himself from the woman. And, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. it's like Joab's protecting himself from... <laughs> 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 That's right. Everybody's like self-protecting. Yeah, yeah. Nobody says it's my response. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like today. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> But yeah, but, uh, it's so true. What so if true. Uriah and Joab had switched places. Mm -hmm. Okay. The note went to Uriah to place Joab at the front and withdraw. Mm -hmm. What do you think Uriah would have done? Hmm. That's a, a good question. Well. I mean, Joab could have ignored the note and fought on. Could have. Should have. Yeah. But he didn't. No. For some reason, he didn't. We don't, like Mark was saying, we don't know what he was actually thinking, if he was actually wrestling with that. You know, it seems like he was a man of, uh, he had a, a, a high rank himself to be able to make that kind of a decision you know, to tell the men to pull back. So he must have been respectable. He must have had uh, um, integrity, you know, except he blew it here too. But he was also trying to follow orders of his commander. And uh, you know how it is sometimes, you know, when given an order, it may not make sense initially so sometimes we don't ask because we don't know the full picture they don't want us to know the full picture 
till later on. So he could have been thinking like that. He, you know what, this doesn't sound right, but I'm sure he knows what he's doing. I don't know, but we know that he followed orders. I think when he's, he's told the messenger, when David questions it, tell him that the Hittite is dead. Yeah, I that's think right. When he said that, he was acknowledging, telling David, that, hey, I know what you did. Yeah, yeah. Well, he, it's possible he's saying that he knows what he did, or he is just covering up his butt because... Well, he is reacting to the loss of several men, not just Uriah. Of course, Joab doesn't know the whole story. So doesn't know the whole story either. Doesn't know the reason. Nope. You see? So, any thoughts, Don? No, that was good. Yeah, we don't know. Yeah. Yeah, we, we don't really know anything beyond that, right? But as far as what he was thinking, all we know is that he was prepared for David to be a little upset or ticked off. Yeah. And that's why at the end he said, Remind, he told the messengers to make sure he knows that um, Uriah is dead. Uriah the Hittite is dead. So he adds that at the end to cover himself, right? And notice, um, and then we'll just take it to, where's it, 32, right? Um, um, so the messenger departed, 22 to 24, and came and reported, let's see, uh, on the bottom there, David's carnality brought sorrow and grief to Bathsheba, who apparently loved her husband and mourned for him. The sins of one believer often involve and hurt others. And let's just take it to the top of 33. When the time of mourning was over, David sent and brought her to his house and she became his wife then she bore him a son but the thing holy spirit wanted us to know this but the thing that david had done was evil in the sight of the lord second samuel 11:27 and lastly no believer can be a winner when out of fellowship or outside of the plan of god David was no exception. Not once during Operation Bathsheba did David confess his sins. He deserved what he gave Uriah, but after the entire incident, David was still what? Uriah's dead. David lived. God still had a plan for David's life. But only after undergoing the severe physical and emotional agony of divine discipline did he finally rebound. Then he could continue to mature as a believer. Imagine that. So here's a guy who sinned. He covered it up with several lives. And God allowed him to live, and he still used them. Is that the grace of God? Yeah. I just think it's also ironic that David, um, when Joab has his concern that David's going to be upset, you know, yeah. that, Dave, that he knows David, so he knows David's going to be upset, but then I just... Forgive me if you use the cognitive dissonance of David. David is like, he is going to get all upset about the loss of these men. Yeah. But he's yeah. getting Uriah killed. It reminds me of, isn't it Nathan? Yeah. 
Nathan's the one who confronts David. Right. The, par the, par the little parable, right? Right, right, right. And David's like all ticked off, but he can't see himself. That's right. That's the deceitfulness of sin. Yeah. You get involved in it, you don't even see what you're doing. You're That's right. You're blind. Yeah. I guess, I maybe I'm wrong. Yeah, I know. I, I, I see that. And in closing, with all that we've said, with all that you've said, everybody here, we can see the damage that sin can do. I mean, we, we're stopping here, right? But we've covered some serious damage. And it costs people their lives. There's collateral damage galore. Not just one person, but several. And these guys are innocent. It's kind of like Adam and Eve. You know, people say, well, if it were me in the garden, I wouldn't have eaten the fruit. So we're suffering because of them. Yeah. Right? That's not fair. There, there might be a riot in heaven when we all <laughs> But the truth is, if they blew it, then we would blow it too. Here we are with you know, sin natures and, you know, we're sinners and they were perfect people and if they blew it, then we would blow it too. Can't, you can't be better than perfect and those two were perfect, right? So the thing we can walk away with here in closing is if we don't deal with the sin issue, if we don't deal with this daily sins, it could cost it could cost quite a bit. What does the scripture say? For the wages of sin is death. Right? So there's the spiritual death, which is ultimately separation from God. There's the physical death, Ananias and Sapphira, or these several men here, right? So, and it, and it could affect the people closest to us, right? So our sin could be, you know, someone could bear the consequences to our wrongdoing. So the best way to deal with it is to f confess it before him. This is why rebound is so important. Because we sin all the time. And if we don't deal with it, the vertical relationship is affected, then eventually the horizontal relationships are affected. It's that vertical relationship that helps us keep horizontal relationships intact. But if this is gone, then this is going to be affected, as clearly seen here. All right? So what do we do? Commit a sin. Even if it's a, if it's a lustful thought, confess it. That way you have the ability to withstand it. You have a greater possibility greater chance of being able to walk away from it, as Mark mentioned earlier. So sin is like an infection that's not dealt with. Yeah, that's right. It just will grow and spread. Yeah, and, and this is, I think, something that's missing uh, among believers today. Yeah. I think, see, we, we always hear people say, well, I'm, I'm just human, I, you know, I'm only human. Yeah, we all are. Yeah. But God's given us a divine power that's accessible. But the problem is, is that, you know, we confess the sin and then 10 seconds later we fall back into sin. And so instead of giving up, we have to confess the sin, get into the Word, allow God the Holy Spirit coupled with the Word of God to transform us. We fall, confess it, transform, fall, confess, get transformed. It's a growth process. But we, we don't want to just say, well, shoot, I'm just, I'm never going to make it. If we have that kind of attitude, then we're just going to continue yeah. to see no power. We're not going to be able to see any change. And real change is available to us as believers, but it starts with rebound. It starts with, with confession. So if we, if we, if we sin a hundred times, we'll confess a hundred times. Because he's faithful and just. He will forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And why would we need to confess? So that we can reestablish the harmony. Why would we need the harmony? So that we can have that empowerment that comes from the third person of the Trinity. So, yeah, we sin all the time. But get into the habit of, Lord, I did it again. 
I know I did it five minutes ago, I did it again. He's going to forgive you and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. It's not for salvation, it's for harmony. And it's to our advantage because then we experience growth and maturity under his direct influence. And then all of a sudden those things that we struggle with will be easier and easier and easier to deal with over time. As we're confessing it, as we're growing, as we're maturing, then the intensity decreases as we grow. Our, our, right now the sin issue or our, the tendency to sin is going like this. But the way for it to go down like this is for growth and maturity to take place. So as we're taking in his word, as we're taking in Bible doctrine on a consistent basis, then we grow, we mature, we're conformed into whose likeness? Jesus Christ. Who does the transforming? Who, who, begin, who began the good work? Christ. So he's going to change us. But we should never give up. Because it's an ongoing struggle for everybody. But he knows that, he's aware of it, and that's why we just remain steadfast. Just keep plugging away. God's not, he, we're, we're not shocking God when we fail him. But if we want to see the intensity decrease over time, we need to grow and mature. It gets easier and easier over time. And how much time? Depends on how fast we're growing. I can't accelerate a baby's growth. I can't accelerate Joshua's growth. But if I would feed him, if I re would regularly feed him, I know in due time, he's going to be able to do the things that I'm doing. But as long as he's immature and young as a child, I can't expect him to do much. So if growth and maturity is what we're aiming for, then there's only one way to grow. And that's through the intake of his word. And what will that do? That'll allow us to, to see and experience over the course of time, over the course of our lifetime, that radical change that comes through constant exposure to his word. Well, I this... Say, Fred, but I always think about the way Paul ends all of his epistles about growing the grace and knowledge of our... Yeah. You're right, if you don't grow... Because I've gone to churches before where they say, stop sinning. Yeah. But if you don't grow... <laughs> That's right. Stop sinning, you know. How do you do that? Yeah. You, you, it's, you can't will it away. You can't just say, I'm going to stop sinning. Um, we need his help. I mean, he said, I need to leave so I can send you a helper. And that helper will help us. But if we're grieving or quenching the helper, we're not going to experience the ability to walk by means of the Spirit, so we will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. But it's easier over time. How much time? It varies. A person who studies once in a while won't experience the same change as a person who's studying on a regular basis and applying it. See? So if you have two children, two kids, one is eating regularly, one is eating once in a while. The one who's eating once in a while is not going to be healthy. And we're, we're going to see a difference over time. Right? So we need to live by every word. Man shall not live by every word, but by every... Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Right? So that's the missing link. The confession part gets us back in harmony with him. But growth and maturity will help us to make better decisions than David in, here in 2 Samuel. I'm not saying we're, we're better than David. I'm just saying we have a power now that he never had on a consistent basis. So we should be able to say no uh, much easier than David, see, because we have his help. Father, thank you as always for giving us the opportunity to study your word and thank you for reminding us of the blunder of David and we're not proud of his mistake uh, we know Lord that uh, we can learn from it we know that he was still used by you and so in so many ways it's an encouragement to us who are not perfect yet we know that on this side of eternity we will never be perfect but we know that uh, in the future when we are face to face with you with glorified bodies we would be perfect 
So thank you for being gracious to us. Thank you for extending grace. Thank you for being faithful to us when we are faithless. And we're so grateful, Father, that we have you as our Savior. So we thank you for all of these things, and we ask and pray these things in your Son's name. Amen.